Hi, welcome. This is Together.Church. I'm Phil Weir, and each week we look carefully and closely at our verse of the day and explore some new ideas and some new insights from God's Word. This week is especially important as we focus on the proof of our identity and we focus on Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. And the whole together worship uh, centers on Romans 8 and songs that tie to the promises of Romans 8. Now, helping us get into this focus of proof of our identity, I want to tell you a little story. We moved to Arkansas uh, from the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex uh, about a year ago. And after being here 30 days, we had to go get an Arkansas driver's license. And so we were dreading it. We knew that where we lived in the Metroplex, you had to go make an appointment. And sometimes you had to wait six or seven hours just to set up an appointment for another day to get your driver's license. So we waited to the last minute, uh, 30 minutes before closing, and went into the Arkansas driver's license office nearest us and sought to get an appointment to get a driver's license. The lady laughed at us and she said, well, I don't know about any other time in your, your future here in Arkansas, but today you're going to be thankful that you're in Arkansas and not in Texas. We went in, she took our information, she took our picture, and then she said, now, before you can have this important form of ID in Arkansas, this driver's license, you've got to give me two forms of federal ID so we can put the little gold stamp on your driver's license. We did. And Donna and I both got our driver's license with our picture fully documented and walked out the door in 25 minutes. You can believe we were thankful to be in Arkansas that day. That saved us eight to 11 hours. We were thankful. But that trip emphasized the reality of the world we live in today. Because of identity theft and identity fraud, we have to have all sorts of forms of identification, proof of our identity. It's frustrating, isn't it? But then if you don't do it, you're vulnerable to all sorts of fraud and theft and loss of your life savings. So when you go online and you do banking or other sensitive uh, information gathering or sharing, you have to have a two-factor authentication. But if that's not enough or if that won't work, then we have facial recognition, don't we? And facial recognition is great. I have it on my phone, except it doesn't work when I have my COVID mask on. It doesn't recognize me. So that's a problem. And then on my laptop and another one of our our phone devices and tablets, we have fingerprint recognition. And fingerprint recognition allows us to get into our device quickly and safely and safeguard it from others. So as we look at our identity in the world, we have all sorts of authentication factors. But what about our identity in Christ? How do we confirm our identity in Christ as a child of the living God, the creator of the universe. This is a crucial issue because you as a believer, as a brother or sister of mine, you you need to be confident that you are God's child and all the promises he has for his children are yours in Christ. But how do you have that assurance? Well, our verse of the day talks about our proof of identity. It's from Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now that's a powerful claim, but already in having this verse or related verses in verse of the day, I've had comments both, public and personal, saying, I resent the term sonship as a woman. It makes me feel excluded. So I want to take a minute and explore a little more deeply why that term is used in the older version of the NIV, the NIV 1984. That's the wording in the Greek. 
because in Jesus and Paul's day, women didn't have a right of inheritance. Only the firstborn male had the right to full inheritance. And so that left out most of the other children. So Paul is not denigrating women. He's not looking down on women. He's elevating them. He's saying, even as a woman in Christ, you're given the full rights of the oldest son. Maybe the best way to do that is to talk about uh, what we could do or say or translate this as that would make a little more sense. And so I don't want to belittle any woman that feels left out by this statement. I want her to understand that this passage is supposed to be about something greater. Instead of sonship, here it is being God's beloved child of highest rank. And the verse would read like this, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of being his beloved child of highest rank. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I get the concern. I get the language that feels sexist. If we're honest in our world today, despite all the talk in the media, the media has had as much power at belittling women. Look at the Hollywood icons that have abused and exploited women and underage women. And that news continues. On top of that, despite all the talk about equal rights, there is not equal pay for women. Oftentimes women are overlooked and the power structure are not promoted. And because they're not part of the good old boy network, they don't have an opportunity to put their uh, two cents worth in on a decision so that their leavening influence is not included and not heard. So I understand the frustration. I understand the uh, anger, but I want you to know, and, and I'll acknowledge, I can't fully understand because I'm a man. So let me at least acknowledge that. But please understand, Paul is saying the opposite of belittling a woman. And in Christ, we've got to live into that truth and reality that in Christ, we are all one and we are all his beloved children of highest rank. And we see that in the verse that follows. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, the spirit of being his beloved child of highest rank. And by him, by the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are sons, his beloved child of highest rank, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Grab a hold of that. Celebrate that. Paul goes on and explains it more fully in Galatians 3, when he says, so in Christ Jesus, you are each God's child of highest rank. Or he says, sons of God through faith. But you are each God's child of highest rank. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This language is revolutionary, and we must live into the truth of it. We must, as God's people, show that women and men are equally valued, that we value red, brown, yellow, black, white, and every shade of skin because God wants all of these to be equally valued as his children in his family, we call the church. And so as we live into that, we must celebrate it. Even this day, this very day that I'm recording, I've received a, an answer from a dear friend and, and pastor in India answering a fellow uh, uh, believer in India about should we allow the untouchables, the Dalits, to serve us, and should we serve them? 
And he emphasized clearly in this caste system where these people were considered worthless and not to be around it, not to be allowed to be touched or touch your stuff or to be included in Christ. Those barriers fall because when they are baptized and confess Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and they are God's child of highest rank. It doesn't matter who they are. They are God's rightful heir and co-heir with Christ. It is phenomenal and breathtaking and revolutionary. And our churches should be saddened that we have not lived into this. And we should celebrate that we can do that in ways that glorify God and not demean people because they're a different gender are there a different race? Are there a different color? Are there a different social economic level? We are one in Christ and we are all God's child of highest rank co heirs with Christ Jesus. Breathtaking. Now let's live it. Let's live into it. But what's the proof of my identity in a world full of fake Christians that don't recognize the truths you're speaking, Phil? And that's a great question. And the answer to that question is our verse of the day. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Our proof of identity is the Holy Spirit. John 3 and Titus 3 remind us that we are born anew, born of God, born from above by the Holy Spirit. This happens through the washing of rebirth and regeneration or renewal through the Holy Spirit. And in this new birth, Jesus pours out his spirit upon us and into us. And we become heirs with the assurance of eternal life with God, our Father. Incredible, beautiful, wonderful. And this presence of the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of this inheritance that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. But again, how do I know that I have the Holy Spirit? How can I be sure? And I want to affirm, I get that question all the time. How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? And so let me give you three answers to that with a little detail under each answer. And I know our video is a little longer this week, but, but the, the truths are so essential and so important. And they revolve around the presence of the Holy Spirit, a neglected focus of our Bible studies. The first answer is, we know we have the Holy Spirit because sometimes the Holy Spirit comes into our lives clearly in clearly demonstrable ways. Now, I'm talking about some things you may have heard about. And let me just emphasize some of those things. Uh, some of those ways have to do with speaking in tongues or speaking in languages. And in the New Testament, those can be human languages and they can be heavenly languages. They were Human languages in Acts 2, they were heavenly languages in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. And some people demonstrate the coming of the Holy Spirit by speaking in these languages. Now, let's acknowledge that this happens with the Jews when the apostles and the early disciples uh, received the Spirit and spoke and people heard in their own language in Acts 2. But when it came to Samaritans being included, and in many ways, Samaritans were the untouchables to Jews. God proved that they were his children. When these people were baptized uh, in water and confessed Jesus as Christ, Lord and Savior, they didn't receive the Spirit. This was strange, goofy, puzzling. So some apostles came from Jerusalem and they met with them and prayed with them and they received the Holy Spirit showing that Samaritans were fully God's children, just like Jewish people were God's children. But what about full Gentiles? What about them? Well, in Acts 10, Cornelius and his family were hearing about Jesus, whom they knew a little about. And as they came to know who Jesus was as Lord, Savior, and Christ, the Messiah, the Holy Spirit came on them. And Peter goes, oh my, who am I to forbid that these should be baptized in water and included in the family of God. If God is already shown through the Holy Spirit, he accepts them. So there were times that people spoke in 
languages, heavenly languages or human languages that was tied to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, other times, some people develop special wisdom almost immediately that they didn't have before as non-Christians. Or others were given the gift of deeper insight and discernment into others. And this is a miraculous gift. That's something they didn't have. Others were given the power to encourage and comfort and correct others honestly, yet gently and effectively. Now, this last one is called the gift of prophecy in Romans 14, 1 through 3. We normally think about New Testament prophecy as predicting the future, and there were a few times it was that. But Paul is saying in the Christian assembly, there is a gift of the spirit of prophecy that helps us be especially encouraging and comforting and correcting to our brothers and sisters. And this is a uh, a miraculous gift that some people are given when they become a Christian. But let's look at a second reality. Often in Acts, the Spirit's coming is not so visibly and immediately demonstrated, but it's more subtle. And we were warned about this from Jesus. He said, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind has evidence of its presence, but we can't see it. And in many uh, new Christians, there is evidence of the Spirit's presence, but it doesn't come with one of these more boldly demonstrable gifts. Well, what is that evidence, Phil? Well, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to make a distinction here. It doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. Because all of us have certain character qualities that are more easily uh, to come by for us. We may be kind or we may be gracious or whatever. But this, the fruit of the Spirit means all nine of these things are growing in us. It's not just one. It's a personality trait. But the coming of the Holy Spirit causes us to move in the direction of godliness by having love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and faithfulness. We have all nine of these growing in us because of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have those nine growing, we don't have the fruit of the Spirit. We just have personality traits. But where the Spirit is present, all nine begin to grow. Some are going to grow faster than others because of who we are. Uh, another way we see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in us as we become more and more like Christ as we pursue Jesus. And that's the promise of 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18, something we've talked about more in the last couple of weeks. And then there's a third way that we see the Holy Spirit come into the lives of people. And it's one that I want to have you grab a hold and cherish. Sometimes we must simply trust the promises of God and then begin to look for the Spirit's presence in our life if there's not a big demonstrable thing that we can see. So here are these four promises. Number one, when we believe, confess, and are baptized in water, we are given the Spirit. That's the promise of Peter through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Acts 2, 38 and 39 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this gift is for you and also for those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The over 3,000 that became Christians on Pentecost were given the assurance they had the Holy Spirit because they confessed Christ, they were baptized in water, their sins were forgiven because the Holy Spirit came into their lives, cleansed them, and indwelled them. And that promise wasn't just for them, but for those who were far off, those of us whom God has called. A second promise we have, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to us as our comforter in John chapters 14 through 16. The third uh, promise is similar to that. Jesus, when he was talking about prayer in Luke 11, says, hey, you fathers who are evil, who are flawed, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more so will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In other words, Jesus is saying, ask for God, the Father, to give you the Holy Spirit, to give you a special filling, a special anointing, a special sense of his presence. But pray 
to receive that. And then the fourth, Paul demonstrates this promise in Ephesians 3, where he prays uh, and he says, I pray that that you will be strengthened in your inner being through the spirit who is within you. And then he finishes with the great promise of verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all we could ask or imagine to him, be glory and in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations. Where is this power? That power is within us. What is that power in that context? That power is the Holy spirit. So have people pray for you to be strengthened and filled with the spirit, have them lay hands and pray over you to sense the spirit's presence so that you can be strengthened with might in your inner being. As Paul says, the spirit is our proof that we are God's child, but not just to any child. We're God's child of highest rank. We are co-heirs with Christ. Everything that God promised for any of us, is promised to all of us because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. My hope for you is this, that the Holy Presence of God within you, the Holy Spirit will become more and more real to you. That you may feel a Spirit to Holy Spirit connection with God so that you can sense the Father's abiding nearness, strength, and comfort in your daily life. I pray that you trust and believe that God is alive in you through his spirit, that Jesus will never abandon you because his spirit lives inside you. And that when your time comes to die, that spirit is still connected with God, the father and nothing can separate you from him. And that spirit will give life to your mortal body and help raise you up on the last day. If you need help in believing that, please know I'm praying for you and I encourage you to read all of Romans 8 again and again and again. You can know your identity as God's child because of his spirit inside you. Until next week, God bless.